6.30, so we're going to get started. Uh, my name is Chris. Uh, I work with an agency called August. We have an office down the street. Uh, we do digital products and, and design services, but we also really care about ideas, and we care about Toronto, and we care about uh, broadcasting good ideas more broadly within Toronto. Uh, we often look to cities like New York, Washington, D.C. that have all these very uh, interesting, rigorous kind of debates and discussions going on on a regular basis, and we think that Toronto's a little bit lacking in, in this regard. So we started this event series to invite um, people who we think to be... Uh, uh, interesting thinkers, big thinkers, who have ideas that are maybe not getting um, as much attention as, as we think they should. This is certainly one um, in that series. Uh, without kind of going into the actual thesis, I'll leave that up to Doug. I'll, I'll, I'd like to just get started and introduce Doug Saunders, who was a columnist with the Globe and Mail, is now a fellow at the uh, Robert Bosch Academy in Berlin, uh, a, a published author, um, and this is the paperback version of his book, which was recently released and uh, slightly updated from the last version. It's excellent. We do have some for sale, so following the talk, you're, uh, you've been engaged uh, to the point that you want to dig a little deeper. Feel free to come and talk to us about, about buying some. The way that, that we're selling the books is on the Eventbrite page that you bought your ticket, there should be a new line item to buy a book. It's at retail price. Uh, Doug has been generous enough to offer signatures and you know whatever you want written in it. So so please do take advantage. Um, and with that said, I'd like to introduce uh, Doug Saunders. Please welcome him. Terrific. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Uh, and I'm really appreciative for this this speaking series. This is this is a great sort of thing to do with a with a marketing agency. And and uh, I hope I hope you build on this as well. And thank you, everybody, for for braving the uh, dysfunction of Toronto's uh, uh, transportation system to somehow to somehow get here. Uh, I got here this morning to see that the subway was on fire in three places during a blizzard, which is, uh, um, I'm living in Berlin now, and that doesn't happen there, so it was like something to talk about. But I mean, this is one of, this is one of the points that I, that I make in this book is that um, when you feel like the city is crowded and you've got enormous numbers of people around you and you're stuck in gridlock and not moving in traffic and that sort of thing, that is not because Toronto is overcrowded. That is because, that is a consequence of Toronto suffering from low population density and from bad planning for population growth. Uh, it's, and I'll, I'll get into the details of that a bit later, but suffice to say that uh, we do not have the transportation networks that we should have because large parts of Toronto have too low a uh, concentration of population to support them uh, over the expanse, but also because our governments uh, are planning uh, and not really successfully planning to invest in the population growth that happened 30 years ago. Uh, and we're not keeping up with that. So a big emphasis of what I'm talking about is shifting from trying to play catch up on population growth that happened a long time ago and try to backfill with infrastructure and, and backfill with things and get to the point where we can start planning and investing in the population growth that's going to happen 50 years from now. Because things usually work better that way and we can make them, them sustainable uh, and so on. So I'll be talking about Toronto a certain amount because it provides good examples and I don't, I don't get a chance to talk about it as much as I'd like. I'm not going to try to persuade you that Canada needs to have a specific population or, or anything like that. Um, um, I'll, I'll maybe a, a little bit I will. Um, 100 million is more of a term of trade with an interesting history behind it in Canada. It was, the government has been concluding that we need 100 million people since 1965 and uh, uh, it, it's a population that would give us a quarter of the population density of Scandinavia in the thin strip of land where Canadians actually live and that sort of thing. But uh, I'm more concerned with what I call having a 100 million mindset, which is to assume that our population is going to triple. Our population will triple, probably at some point. It'll definitely double this century. Um, and the last time that happened, we got lucky. And part of my argument is we don't quite have the same 
lucky situation in Canada that we did the last time the population tripled, and we, we need to do it right. So we need, to, we need to be able to make the plans and do the things to marshal population growth uh, to our advantage. Um, so the history of that growth, if you were alive in 1945, which a couple of you might have been, um, if you were alive in 1945, then you have already experienced a tripling of the Canadian population during your lifetime. The, the Canadian population tripled between 1945 and 2015 or thereabouts, and it took us by surprise. Um, when we came out of the war, we did not expect to grow much above uh, maybe 20 million someday, and there were dire warnings. Famous, uh, famous economists were warning in McLean's and Saturday Night that that if if we expanded beyond it, something like 20 million, it would be the ruin of us. We'd become Americanized. We'd have horrible urban ghettos with crime in them. Uh, we would not be able to produce enough food for ourselves and we would have uh, uh, crises of food. We would, wouldn't have an independent culture, those sort of things. And um, there were large debates about immigration, much more so than there are today. Um, and th then there was never any decision. Population growth happened by accident in the 50s and 60s. And, uh, and we played catch up. We, we suddenly would discover every 20 years or so that we didn't have enough schools and we'd have enormous programs to build a whole lot of schools to catch up for the population growth that had happened in the previous decade, which is part of the reason why every, why every high school in Ontario looks exactly the same as every other high school in Ontario, because they were all built in 1965 in a mad panic. And, uh, and a lot of them, like um, Clinton Street School here, had to invent programs like... Um, uh, the first use of the word multiculturalism in Canada was in the late 1950s at, to, at the Ontario Ministry of Education to describe these new programs they devised at Clinton Street School to allow immigrant kids to learn English without removing them from the normal classrooms, which was a big innovation, that sort of thing. But everyone had to invent these things from the ground up because there was no planning. And, and we'll get to this later, but there's a bit of a legacy of the fact that we grew accidentally and we've grown accidentally from the beginning. Because until the, until the Second World War, Canada didn't grow. We lost more people. Uh, we had more emigrants leave Canada almost every decade in our first century than we had come to Canada as immigrants. During the, during the huge immigration wave that brought a third of the population of, the new, of, the, of Europe to the New World, Canada during that entire period su suffered a net migratory loss of people to the United States. So we had a legacy, a sparse legacy. We were more rural after the Second World War than we were before. So that shaped the structure of things a bit. Um, but we got lucky because the newcomers who came to Canada s discovered a country that had uh, huge labor shortages in a growing economy, as we do now. Uh, it had uh, housing that nobody wanted, huge expanses of it. And remember, until the 90s, Toronto had a, a housing surplus. Most Canadian cities had housing surplus. It had more, more housing than there was demand for housing. Uh, house prices bid downward until the late 90s. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and there were huge neighborhoods in inner cities that had basically been abandoned by the middle class and that you could make a start and buy that cheap house, improve it, open a little shop on the ground floor, use the rising value of that house and the revenues from your little shop or something to finance the education of your kids and that sort of thing and build social and real capital in an area that was tightly knit with other people. So that Canadian model of integration, which was based very much on housing ownership and that sort of thing, it worked very well. Uh, employment worked very well, small business creation worked very well, and it was fairly easy for Canada to grow, not through any great policy moves, there were a few, that came up on both federal and provincial levels, but mainly by luck and by, by playing catch up. Now the next tripling of the Canadian population, um, this briefly, this is Statistics Canada's latest projection of Canada's population growth, which uh, shows a low, medium and high growth scenario. The low growth scenario is pretty unrealistic. You would have to have no immigration at all 
for the rest of the century for that to occur. And I'll talk about this later, that, that even if we have an anti-immigration party in power for a number of terms of office, that probably won't actually affect immigration numbers very much. Um, so something between the medium and high growth is realistic, which gets us close to 60 uh, million by the 2060s. Um, so a doubling of the population is likely, and uh, there's a number of reasons why we will, and I'll talk about them later, about why we will likely have governments that will want uh, immigration levels somewhat higher than we have now to deal with the, the big uh, fiscal and economic crunches of the 2030s and 2040s. So maybe they won't, maybe we will, but it's, it's very likely that somebody who's alive in 2100, at which point the world population will no longer be growing, will be falling, will be in a, in a Canada with at least twice as many and maybe three times as many people. Um, and to understand that, we have to understand what the drivers of immigration to Canada are. So this graph from 1860 up to 2015 at the end, that's the most recent data available. The dark blue line is the interesting one. It's the immigration rate. It's the number of immigrants per thousand people that coming in, well, if you imagine a zero at the end of this, so if this is 10, 20, 30, this line shows immigrants per, uh, per thousand people. So generally from the uh, early 90s onward, Canada has had pretty much the same immigration rate of about eight immigrants per thousand people each year. Um, in the last couple of years, the Liberal governments have ticked it up slightly, so it's risen slightly to just above one on the right-hand side there. So we're, we're, we now have around 10 immigrants per thousand people, which is still way lower than the levels that we had in the 1950s. Um, and that's, that's it. and of course, the only time we've had mass immigration was here during the, uh, during the Laurier years. Um, if we were going to have immigration on that level, uh, today, if we would have close to two million immigrants a year coming into Canada. Right now, even the most ambitious people talk about 400,000, which was what you'd need to get up to 100 million by the end of the century. We, we, we take 340,000 a year now. Um, so the other takeaway from this is what causes that line to move? And it's not that people elect a government that is for higher immigration or that's for lower immigration. In the late 1950s, under John Diefenbaker's uh, later terms, he became very interested in trying to stop a lot of immigration. He, be, he became concerned there were too many of the southern Italians and other undesirables uh, coming in and, uh, and just became very skeptical of immigration. He tried to slow it and stop it and he tried to put restrictions on family reunification and so on. And it failed. And it mainly failed uh, because the Canadian economy was booming and it needed people. And when nature abhors a vacuum, when it, an economy needs people, it gets people, regardless what the policies of the government are. But the opposite thing you see in the early 90s. Jean Chrétien came into power hoping to raise Canada's immigration numbers up to, I think, 300,000 or something. Um, and they didn't go up, they went down. He set targets that were higher. People wouldn't come. Why? Because Mid-1990s, the Canadian economy was a disaster. Banks were failing, uh, huge unemployment, fiscal crisis. The Wall Street Journal called us a third world country. We had to cut one-fifth of the employees of the federal public service. Things were, things were catastrophic here. People don't immigrate to a country when the economy's not doing well. People leave a country, right? During the 2008 crises in Europe and the United States, there was a net outflow of immigrants from the United States back to Mexico and Central America. There was a net outflow of people from Europe back to Turkey and North Africa and that sort of thing. So, so if the economy is bad, people won't come no matter what your immigration policy is. If the economy is good, it's very hard to stop it happening. So we have to remember that, that whatever we desire, if we're lucky and we have an economy that's doing well, we will have people coming. And, and, and so I, I like to sort of step away from the idea that we should target a certain population and so on. I mean, the 100 million thing, the key chapter in this book is called The Case Against 100 Million, which argues we should not be pursuing this unless we have the right things in place, uh, unless we, which is sort of the substance of this talk today. But the fact is that we may not be able to, to control that uh, unless we become a much less open society uh, or we have some kind of disaster here, right? 
Um, the worry about a climate disaster is not climate migration, it's that it would prevent people from coming. Um, and there's another reason why I'm skeptical of the idea that, that, uh, that we will have a different immigration, uh, uh, immigration system or a lower one, which is that any government that comes into power in Canada is confronted with some stark realities uh, about the future uh, that causes both major parties, even the Conservatives when they're pretty conservative, uh, and they have those moments occasionally, uh, uh, tend not to touch absolute immigration numbers because of the things they're looking at. The 2030s and 2040s are going to be a very difficult time uh, for Canadian governments because our population is going to be much older. The famous figure, and you've probably seen this in, in newspaper articles and things, is that uh, right now we have about four working age Canadians who are paying into the income tax system to support each over 65 Canadian. People over 65, while often quite wealthy, uh, tend to be consumers rather than producers of fiscal revenues, that mainly through health care, but also through uh, uh, old age pensions and things like that. Um, and so we, we right now have four working age Canadians for every retiree, retiree age Canadian. By the 2030s, we will have two. Uh, and it'll make things hard to work up. So this is, this is, um, this is the uh, uh, share of Canadians over 65 rising. This is the share of the other dependent group, which is Canadians under 14, who are less expensive on the system because they don't, they, they, their health care costs and so on, and, and continuing care costs aren't expensive. And that will create a crunch in a number of ways. Um, first of all, it'll create large-scale labor shortages. We have about... We, by the best estimates, we have about 500,000 fewer working age people than we have s spots for good full-time work. Uh, and that, unless something goes very badly wrong in the economy, will rise to a million during the next, by the end of the next decade. Uh, and, uh, um, and it's not just high-skilled areas that our immigration system tends to fill. Anyway, part of the problem is we have a lot of low-skilled and semi-skilled positions that our immigration system does not fill. Again, we get lucky because the family members of point system immigrants tend to fill those spots and often have better employment outcomes than the actual main immigrants. But uh, uh, that's going to be a problem, labor shortages. Second of all, um, the... Uh, uh, the federal government's expenditures on old age, which are currently, that's currently the single largest spending item at the federal level is, is old age security. Um, it's about 16% of the federal budget and it'll go up to over 20 by the end of the next decade. That's a slice of the pie that's hard to, it's politic, I mean, you could probably conceive of a government that says we're gonna cut that, but they're not gonna get elected. Um, and third, and, and most seriously, uh, at the provincial level, the healthcare costs are going to rise a lot. So health is already the largest, this is Ontario here on the left currently, health is already the largest slice of the spending pie. Uh, it's close to 40%. And by 2034, according to the best projections available, it'll rise to something like 55, 56%. Again, it's, that increase is driven by an aging population. It's politically very difficult to touch that. That is the group of people who vote the most. Um, so it's unlikely that, now of course, you can expand the, the pie, you can reduce that slice by expanding the pie and raising taxes. Uh, you can also re reduce it by having higher immigration levels. Immigrants don't solve these problems permanently. The 2030s and 2040s are going to be a difficult pair of decades, even if we have quite high levels of immigration, partly because immigrants uh, integrate. That is, immigrants have a lot of children when they first arrive in the first generation. Children of immigrants who were born in Canada, regardless of where they're from, tend to have almost exactly the same number of children as anyone else in Canada. So you get a one generation boost of, of youth. So it, it staves off problems by a couple decades. Um, that said, uh, higher immigration level will make this, will reduce the size of that pie and will make things a lot easier. And every government knows that uh, of, of every party. Um, and 
The 2030s and 2040s are also going to be exactly the period when the costs of our climate obligations are going to be at their highest. Um, that's the period when we have to start investing in creating a carbon neutral economy and uh, moving to non-fossil fuel transportation and building sea barriers and things like that, the, the large climate infrastructure that we're going to need. Climate is going to be very expensive and by the 2030s and 2040s, it won't be an ideological matter, it'll be a practical matter that even governments that don't believe in it will probably have to face at least in, in, in some respects because it will be a looming reality. So we will have very high fiscal costs with an aging population who are reducing the amount of tax revenues you've got while health and, and old age costs are increasing. So that crunch, I think, is going to incentivize governments in Canada to uh, keep immigration levels reasonably high. Yes, we could get a, a, a super anti-immigration party in power for a term or two terms. And in Canada, I think it's possible to have such a party elected by a more diverse group of Canadians. Uh, but I, I even, two things I've learned about watching parties like that in power in, in Europe and somewhat in the United States is that, first of all, they don't last very long. Um, second of all, they, they, they usually fail. Uh, they, they, they're at most able to reduce immigration numbers by a, like a margin by 20% maybe or something like that. But again, if the economy is working well, it, it doesn't tend to. Every attempt to cut immigration levels dramatically I've seen, unless the country's economy is failing, has, has failed in the long term. So. So I think we need to be talking about um, how to plan for a larger population this century. And that will help address um, a few other things in Canada that are problems. Canada grew in a way that leaves it very inefficient in, in the way its population is distributed. Um, and that makes it right now uh, that creates some problems that, that are going to lead to economic in inefficiency, to ecological in inefficiency, and to, to culture and, and, and movement inefficiency and, 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 and flaws uh, as, as our population ages and changes. And I'd like to get into this topic through this painting, which is a good one for a day like this. Um, I, I love Lauren Harris's paintings of uh, city. He's famous for the big icebergs and all that sort of thing. But his paintings of Toronto are all, all really fascinating, usually of back, you know, uh, garage shed lane ways and that sort of thing. And this one is, was always a great entry point into my understanding of how Canada grew and developed. So I remember when I first saw this in the 80s or early 90s, um, thinking, okay, it's, uh, that's Toronto apparently. And uh, and thinking, where on earth is that in Toronto? That does not look like anything in Toronto. And his other paintings in this series, it's all clapboard shacks, and it looks a bit like the slums of Mumbai or something like that. Um, and in fact, and that's 1921, in fact, that's, that's um, what we'd now call the city of York in um, sort of St. Clair and uh, uh, what do they call that area? Um, around where Giovanni Caboto pool is, <laughs> or uh, Joe Piccinini pool. Anyway, Earl's Court is that neighborhood's name, yes. And um, the, the, the geographer Richard Harris at McMaster did a big analysis of real estate records and so on in the 1990s, where he found that in the 1910s and 1920s, a third of, pop, of Toronto's population and other people say closer to half of Toronto's population lived in these self-built squatter communities on the edge of town. Um, like they, and if you look up the Toronto Daily Star from, from those decades, there are constant articles about how Toronto was being subsumed by these self-built squatter communities on, built on empty farmland around the edge of town. Toronto was a, like a city surrounded by shack towns. Uh, and the newspapers going about they're insalubrious and, and needed reform and they, you know everyone had toilets in the ground and that sort of thing. And eventually they got cleaned up in the 1930s and turned into the, occasionally if you drive around and look around carefully, you can see that the streets follow weird patterns and that sort of thing. But most of Etobicoke and City of York and so on, sort of the last surviving bits of that shack town development was ended with Hurricane Hazel. 
which, uh, which wiped out uh, and killed a lot of people who lived in the last shack town developments, which were in the bottom of the Don and Humber Valleys. And, uh, um, but why was that happening? Because our idea of how Canada grew is a little bit like how the United States grew, which is the idea that people arrived, got off a boat, took a train, and arrived downtown in a big city, and then they built the streetcar lines outward, and the suburbs grew out from the big city, and it was, it was that sort of growth. This is, this is Young Street in 1900, which kind of gets, gives you that idea. That's, that's the percent. Look at all the bicycles, by the way. And, uh, uh, but actually, there wasn't much of that. Uh, there was a lot more of what you see in, in the previous uh, picture, because the way Canada was settled in the late 19th and 20th century was uh, a very deliberate targeted policy to try not to create cities uh, and be urban. And we all know about the big immigration drives uh, under McDonald and Laurier and, and Borden and, uh, and, uh, and Mackenzie King and so on. Um, in almost all of those drives, and most of them failed, uh, the immigration agents were sent, you know, with those horse-drawn wagons with sh sheafs of wheat painted on the side, and they were under specific orders to recruit uh, farmers, farm laborers, and women who could be domestic uh, servants. Um, and, and very specific instructions not to bring in people who were urban, or entrepreneurial, or had higher education, uh, or or business or trade ambitions, and that sort of thing, um, and and there were big debates about this. I mean, even under Laurier, who who brought in enormous numbers of people, there was a real there was. Part of, part of his understanding with Clifford Sifton as, as immigration minister was that we are not going to be bringing in urbanites. We're not going to be forming cities. Don't worry. We'd, we're just bringing in people in bearskin coats and that sort of thing and uh, people who will start farms. And, and we were lucky in one sense that about 70% of those people never ended up on a farm. They either, they either did it for a couple years and realized that it was disastrous uh, if you think of my family members who settled in, in uh, the area around what is now Calgary, they lasted for about two years until they realized there were no hospitals, there was no infrastructure, you were making about half the revenue that you'd make if you were in the Dakotas, because uh, the, the railway system was a monopoly that ripped you off and they, they only wanted to sell the grain to, to England and, uh, and, and all that. And, and they left and went back to, uh, in my family's case it was Hamilton, uh, and, but in lots of other families did, and all, a huge proportion just never did. And they actually ended up being quite successful urbanites. So by 1904, Canada's main, even during the peak of the wheat boom, Canada's main economy was stuff like steel making and chemicals and electricity and stuff like that. We were an urban economy, but it took us until the 1940s to realize that we were, and we had policies of settlement designed strategically to fill space um, rather than to try to develop economies and, and, inf and networks and so on, which had two catastrophic effects. One, of course, was that because we were settling Canada strictly to strategically fill space, uh, we, we drove out and, and removed the people who were living in that space, who had been masters of the global economy and, and had been very good at, at, at turning the land into, into revenues for international trade, but the Korea and so on were, were moved out into unfarmable areas of the Canadian Shield, their children then removed from them and sent into residential schools, etc. That was the first consequence of that form of settlement. The second one was that our cities formed by accident. Our cities formed, like in that Lauren Harris painting, largely by people giving up on farming or deciding early on that they weren't going to, and and settling there in a city that did not want to be a city. Remember, Toronto wanted to be uh, a place where you drove your cows in to sell them to market. It was an agricultural market town, really until fairly late in its development. And, and a lot of other cities were, were like that. And as a consequence, I mean, I've often argued that Toronto was a city built by its suburbs inward rather than by its, by its central city outward. Um, and, uh, uh, and as a consequence, a lot of our cities didn't, were not built with efficient you know, distribution of people across the land, with efficient use of transportation infrastructure. So 
we ended up uh, with a lot of this sort of thing. Lots of, lots of countries ended up with big sprawling suburbs uh, and so on, um, but uh, ours, ours were developed sort of as the first instance uh, of, of the city, and now these places on the outskirts are where immigration happens, right? Because the, the old dense inner cities are, are outpriced uh, and, and difficult to, re difficult to, to afford. Um, people make their start in Canada in low density apartment areas. The slab farm apartment, I've often argued, is Can Toronto's distinctive form of housing is not, you know, not the Victorian Bay and Gable uh, or the split level. It's the, it's the 20, 25 story white cement slab farm of four or five apartment towers in the suburbs. We have 2,000 of those 1950s, 60s, and 70s slab farm apartments in the suburbs of, of Toronto. We're the only city in the, we're the only country in the world that has suburban apartment towers as our like signature form of housing. And, uh, and they tend to have very low population density because they have big empty areas between them. So we'll talk about that in a bit because that's one of the consequences of us having a problem of low population density. Um, these are the big cities of the world. Um, Vancouver technically seems to have a fairly high density. It's in between Boston and Turin. But I'm pretty sure that way of measuring Vancouver uh, ignores parts of Richmond and Surrey that extend out, out of the center. I think, I think if you look at greater metropolitan Vancouver, it has a very low population density. And it's just a certain area in the center. Um, Toronto has quite a low population density. Uh, compared to other places, particularly if you include the, G the larger parts of the GTA, as we'll see. I mean, Toronto's is not a lot higher than Mississauga's, uh, which is a suburb. Calgary has a lower population density than Mississauga, which is not very good for Calgary. Uh, and Calgary's leadership are just kind of dealing with this problem now. But anyway, we don't have a great distribution of people, but it's even worse if you look at where people live. Um, the yellow areas here are low population density. Um, and they are often the places that are closest to transportation hubs, which is not the way you want things to be. And it's even worse if you get to look at uh, how Toronto itself is configured. Um, you've heard, a lot of you probably heard the phrase yellow belt before, the area where um, the only thing that's legally allowable to build are single family houses on separate lots, and you, where it is, it is illegal to change that into anything else. It happens to be in the area that would most benefit from having a mass transit network uh, serving it. And, it that, the, and those parts of Toronto, which is basically, you know, if it's the entire sort of inner downtown or middle, middle downtown, um, cannot develop the population density that would support those sort of transportation networks. So aside from questions of, of funding and so on, uh, it's difficult to do, but it's worse than that because um, those districts tend to be the ones that actually have a declining population. So Toronto's population, even if current immigration to Canada doesn't change much, or if it, even if it goes back to like 2015 levels, um, Toronto's population will be close to 9 million by the 2040s. Um, so we are going to have a larger population, but those yellow belt neighborhoods um, are, a lot of them are those ones that are orange or red on this map. All the ones that are orange or red have had a long-term shrinking population, those neighborhoods. So like a significant number of Toronto's neighborhoods, something like a third of them, have shrinking population even as the city grows. Those tend to be the neighborhoods that are that are designated only single family houses. And a third of the houses in that yellow belt part of Toronto have a family size of one. I mean, Toronto has one of the largest bedroom surpluses in the Western world. Uh, in the, number of, the number of households that have one person in them, and they tend to be three or four bedroom houses or five bedroom houses. Um, it's, we're not, we're, I mean, in our, our parents' and grandparents' time, it was normal to have a border in your house, but, uh, and I know a few people who do, but uh, 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 we're, we're not back there. So we have, we have a problem where we actually have the capacity easily to have a, a tripling of population in Toronto and in Vancouver and in Montreal and in Calgary, uh, but, but we, have a, we have a deadlock in the ability to use the space we have. Um, 
and I don't think we're in an era where ur urban sprawl is going to be the solution to that anymore. Um, urban sprawl tends to be, uh, it, it, it tends to reach a limit at a certain point, partly because the land gets developed, uh, but partly because uh, it, it, just, it just stops working. If, en if energy and transportation costs go up, that'll be, that'll be more the case. Um, that, that said, there needs to be a political will to, pre to prevent that from happening and to allow concentration to happen. But we certainly have the capacity, and in fact, Toronto and Vancouver are both at points right now where I, I, I call it sort of the, the sort of, um, uh, the uncanny valley of, 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 of urban development where we've, passed, we've long passed the point where our infrastructure and our transportation networks and so on uh, can support the population. So we're a city of, I don't know what, f five million now. Um, we sort of have the infrastructure for a city of three million, um, yet we need to snap up to a level of a city of eight million before we can really Build, build the next thing there. We're stuck in this place, we're stuck in this weird place where we've out, outgrown our previous wardrobe and we can't yet afford the next wardrobe, which is why, partly why I talk about right now most of our planning is to address the growth that happened in the 1990s. Um, like the most ambitious thing with the Toronto subways and so on, which is not very ambitious, uh, and, and with, with, with any other infrastructure stuff right now, is to deal with the population growth that happened 20, 25 years ago. Um, and we're at a point where we actually need to be building the, 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 you know, the new suit to, to, to fit us for a population of eight million. We really should be thinking about that eight or nine million population and building that thing ahead. Other uh, cities have done it. London in the, in the 1930s built its uh, underground system for population growth that wasn't gonna happen for 30 or 40 years uh, in, or, in order to spur it and so on. So it, so it is possible and it is possible to address uh, it by, to, to address that growing population without expanding the envelope that people live in in Canada. Um, this is the, what they call the missing middle. This guy invented this idea. Between Toronto has a lot of this, and it has some of this at, uh, downtown and at subway intersections and so on. It has surprisingly little of this, of this sort of... Um, you know, a six apartment building uh, on a residential street. Um, and here, this is, um, this is a guy, there's an urban planner in Toronto named Gil Meslin who goes around taking photos of different types of housing. In the downtown Toronto neighborhoods, like around here in the annex, it, basically anything south of St. Clair, you see these things on the right. So this house on the left is a standard single family house, um, which probably has an average population family size of two, but maybe has one, <laughs> like a third of them have one. This one on the right is on exactly the same lot, and it has six apartments, which I think four of them are three bedroom apartments, and two of them are, are two bedroom apartments. So it, it probably could hold, um, I don't know, 15 people comfortably, uh, uh, possibly more in, in today's economy and that sort of thing, uh, on exactly the same size lot without changing the quality of life or the character of the neighborhood and that sort of thing. And if you live in that area sort of between about here and St. Clair, you know that every sort of sixth or seventh or eighth house on your street is one of those. And that's the thing, if you do the math, you realize that, and no, nobody's been allowed to build any of those things on the right uh, for decades, right? A lot of them were built before Second World War, shortly after the Second World War, some in the 50s and 60s, and then bang, we just, we're, we just outlawed the building of sixplexes or even threeplexes uh, on residential lots. If we, um, if we said uh, every third or fourth house on a street could be one of these things, that would immediately allow the population of Toronto to triple without changing its character a single bit. Uh, and, uh, 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 I mean, there, there might be parking issues if people were being, were being car driven, but that, that can be addressed fairly easily because it was back in the day. And also having a few of those on every street would, would give you the population density to allow mass rapid transit. Um, it would also allow it to be much more economic, ecologically efficient form of housing because a modern multiplex is uh, much more ecological to heat than a single family house is. Um, and I'll talk about that because the ecological problems we have of low density in cities are, are large problems. So I'll talk about that in a second. But, um, 
But let's look at the solutions that we need to deal with, uh, with, with, the population, with the population growth that's probably going to happen. That's what I mean when I talk about a 100 million mindset is even if you are of the mind that we should not increase the population at all, we should do whatever dramatic things we need not to, perhaps because you don't like the ecological idea of more humans in a space, uh, maybe you, have, you don't like immigration, or, or you just would like Canada's current scale and character to remain the same. Um, even then, actually, as a way to deal with policy, thinking of us as soon have, having 100 million people is the way to, to address the policy changes that we need now. Because if you look at the things that the next generation of Canadians are facing, it's the same set of problems that the next uh, immigrant wave of Canadians will face. We have a crisis of housing supply in all of the cities of Canada. There's a crisis of housing supply in most of the major cities of the world right now, which is, as I've shown, largely caused by political immobility in, in housing stock. We have a crisis of transportation uh, that is preventing a transition to, to green forms of transportation. We will have that problem even if our population does not grow. We have a, we have a crisis of, uh, of the rest of the world economy being less friendly to, uh, to an export-driven economy and therefore domestic demand becoming much more important uh, in, in economies. The idea of a company like BlackBerry, starting again, BlackBerry was what was called a straight-to-global company. Um, it, it didn't try to build a domestic market in Canada and then use that success to, to build a world market. It went straight into world markets. Um, that is really difficult to do now in a way that it wasn't 10 or 15 years ago. The number of countries that either are highly protectionist now or have uh, preferential national purchasing policies, which includes now India, China, and the United States, a lot of the biggest economies of the world have really rigid preferential binational policies, which makes it difficult. So suddenly the need for a large domestic market or at least for policies that allow businesses to, uh, to attempt to build a base in, a in whatever size domestic market you have before they, before they go international is, is unaddressed in Canada. We're not used to doing that. We're not used to providing those sort of supports in a robust way that other countries do. So, and I could go on. The list, the list of things that you imagine we would need if our population was going to triple in the coming decades is exactly the list of things that we have to deal with right now for the generation of Canadians coming of age now anyway. So if we imagine our own children and grandchildren being the 100 million, we can start to get our heads around it there. That's what I mean by 100 million mindset. So we need to talk about... Uh, infrastructure, by which I mean transportation infrastructure. We have, um, we have among the least green transportation systems in the world. Um, and, and it's not just a matter of being able to get from Toronto to Montreal. Uh, it's a matter of how do we get the natural resources that form the largest part of our uh, foreign exchange revenues uh, out of the country. And I'm not just talking about oil. Uh, the way we get grain to market is through diesel trucks uh, on, in huge volumes and so on. We're hugely dependent on diesel trucks going down highways for bringing almost everything to market to a degree that other countries aren't right now. We need to have a green transition. Um, and a lot of that has to do with, the, with that urban structure problem that I talked about. Um, the Canada's carbon emissions, yes, the oil industry contributes quite a lot, particularly if you include the end use, but the largest share of Canada's CO, uh, greenhouse gas emissions come from inefficient urban living. Uh, the largest single uh, uh, source of greenhouse gas emissions in Canada is transportation, and the largest share of that is, is private automobiles, and we're overly dependent on, on private automobiles because of the way our cities are structured inefficiently. Uh, you've probably heard everyone in Toronto say you can't live here without a car, even if, you're, even if you're a bicycle maniac. Almost all bicycle commuters also have a car and that sort of thing, which is unusual. Uh, and uh, uh, the second largest uh, uh, emission is heating. Um, 
of houses and, and the dependence on the single family house with its extremely inefficient uh, uh, thermal systems is, is the largest sort of waste of, heat, of heating resources that we have. Uh, we have not made the transition to modern building forms that other places have. We have not updated our building stock. We, have, we do not have uh, the level of green building codes that, that other jurisdictions have. And we don't have incentives to make that transition. We have some, but we don't have them to the robust degree. And the third is, is electrical generation which in, in Ontario is not bad because we tend to have a carbon neutral hydro nuclear based system, but a lot of other provinces of Canada are highly reliant on burning fossil fuels uh, for electricity. And the reason why they can't make that transition is because of low population density. They don't have the fiscal revenue, they don't have the consumer demand that would justify a transition to alternative or nuclear or, or, or something else. Uh, and they don't have the population density to make sense of it and they don't have the, the, the fiscal revenues for that. So it doesn't make sense as a priority. Um, so that, those three things together account for 50% of the greenhouse gas emissions in Canada. So, that, so we can do a lot more to make a green transition simply by making urban life more concentrated and uh, better served with infrastructure and so on than we can through almost, almost anything else. Um, and I should add, uh, we know that having denser, larger cities is more ecologically uh, efficient than having a lot of smaller places. Um, who is the, the physicist? There's uh, Louis Betancourt, who's a, a, a theoretical physicist who studies energy use of human agglomerations and cities and so on. He found what, what he calls the uh, uh, sublinear scaling, which is to say that a city of eight million people, even regardless of its efficiency level, um, uses 15% less energy and, and you needs 15% less infrastructure than two cities of four million people. On the, uh, regardless of uh, uh, all other factors aside. Um, and basically confirmed what people call the, the ecological Kuznets curve. Once you get, get above a certain population density, when it, uh, the addition of an ad each additional person to a city reduces the per capita energy com consumption uh, of the city. And Canadian cities are all well within this point where we're at adding to, to that. So there's reasons to become more concentrated and to become a, a country of larger cities rather than a, a country of people distributed across smaller centers because it, it's, it burns a lot less energy and it, 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 it set, sends off less greenhouse gases. And a large part of that shift is simply because when you're in more concentrated larger cities, you don't need to drive to work. You know, you can, you can walk or take the subway or that sort of thing. That alone actually is one of the largest ways of, uh, of reducing energy output. So I know it sounds paradoxical to say that a higher population base uh, will lead to less consumption of energy, but uh, not only will it lower, lead to less per capita consumption of energy with the denominator, the actual capita being higher, but it, it will allow us to afford the transitions to a, a carbon neutral economy that we cannot afford now because we do not have the fiscal base to support those kinds of transitions. It's very hard for, but for governments to budget the huge projects we need based on the sort of fiscal resources that we have now. Um, we need to start talking about bringing Canadian families into uh, questions of population growth. There's a real problem in a lot of countries where uh, that, that do depend on immigration to, to fill labor shortages and, and to, to, deal with, uh, to deal with aging populations and so on, in that people feel angry that the newcomers are getting settlement resources and so on. And, and I would argue that in Canada does not invest enough in newcomers. We should be investing a lot more in uh, getting credentials uh, up to Canadian standards, in, uh, in, in ensuring that, uh, that uh, children have the best opportunities in, in primary and secondary school and so on. Um, and 
domestic populations feel, well, why aren't I getting any of that? And so on. And that creates political crises that leads to nasty things happening in elections and that sort of thing. And part of the reason is that a lot of Canadians feel that they can't afford to have as many children as they would like to have. Now, I, I would not argue for a French-style natalist policy where, where the government pays people to have more children. Uh, it tends to be demeaning and... and, and uh, I mean, the French government actually gives a medal every year to the mother of the year, who usually is photographed in a white gable house in the cover of a magazine with her nine children and that sort of thing. Uh, we don't do that. But we have what's called a fertility gap, which is when you survey people when they're in their couples, when they're in their 20s, and you say, how many children would you like to have? And then you survey them in their 40s, and you say, how many children did you have? And the gap between that is the fertility gap. And that's about... Uh, 0.8 children in Canada. So people, most couples want to have something closer to three children, and most couples end up having something between one and two children. 1.6 is the average. Um, and if you ask them why, sometimes it's because our relationship fell apart, or hey, I'm infertile, or, or we changed our minds, uh, or that sort of thing. But 70% of them say it was for financial reasons, that they did not have that third child or second child and so on. And financial reasons usually means child care expense. Sometimes it means that we can't afford to add a room onto our house, but it usually it means child care costs $20,000 a year in Toronto per child and we can't do that. Uh, and we know from the example of Quebec that if you want to help people be able to participate in population increase, Quebec introduced a subsidized child care program. It started at $5 a day. It's about 20 now, still way less than other places. Um, when they started it in the 90s, Quebec's uh, average family size was way below the Canadian average. They had like 1.2 children compared to 1.6 or 1.7 for the rest of Canada. And that program caused it to rise to the Canadian average. Um, and more importantly, it, it allowed uh, a large percentage of women in Quebec to enter the workforce when they'd been excluded from it. And it paid for itself. Uh, because the tax, income tax revenues generated by more women entering the workforce more than covered the entire cost of the childcare uh, program. So it, it shows, it, we have a Canadian example showing there's a way to allow existing Canadian families to participate in population growth so that they don't feel they're being left out of it, uh, without, it without it seeming like a, some weird totalitarian, you know, pop out more babies sort of argument. Um, we need to recognize that um, we're still not very good at inventing stuff and at creating the sort of places where people do invent stuff. The Silicon Valleys or the uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts uh, networks or the Silicon Roundabouts or, or whatever, name, name your favorite cluster of uh, invention and, and knowledge in the world. And I think an important part of this is to recognize that while the population growth that occurs this century will be concentrated in the metropolitan areas of Canada's three to five largest cities, um, the places where we need to really make it focused is in the medium-sized urban area, small cities and clusters of towns that have universities in them and often that have multiple universities in them. That's where immigrants want to settle now. Um, People who come to Canada tend to have university degrees, like, like seven out of 10 people who immigrate to Canada now have, have a degree, which is twice the rate that Canadian-born Canadians do, but they have credentials that can't be recognized uh, or that need a year or two of additional college or university to have your law degree recognized in Canada or your, your, your x-ray technician diploma recognized in Canada or something. And then they go to Toronto or Vancouver, they realize there's absolutely no way while driving taxi, uh, I, can, I can, and paying Toronto rent, I can get that extra time off to take that extra year of university while putting my kids through their own education. And they're quickly learning that you need to move to Lethbridge or Kitchener-Waterloo or Hamilton or Kingston or Trois-Rivières or one of those places that's medium-sized, it has a university, uh, it has housing you can afford, and it has a municipal government that is very eager to have newcomers because it's boarding up its shops and, and its population is aging and its property tax revenues are declining, and so on. So those places need to start recognizing themselves as being the future knowledge 
and innovation centers of Canada. And I know there's always a lot of talk in federal government programs of creating innovation clusters and things like this, but actually doing that means picking a place and saying, we're going to do this. And a lot of these places are ahead of the higher levels of government in doing that. I mean, Kitchener-Waterloo put in an LRT line that everyone laughed and said, oh, okay, this is, for, this is for a level of population that doesn't exist yet. Hamilton did it. Um, Peel region tried to and failed, I don't know why. Uh, but that, that sort of thing needs to happen of looking at these places as being the next big centers in Canada and, and investing in them and assuming that all of those, those medium-sized cities with universities in them are going to be the next big cities uh, and, and building them for future growth. And again, we need to recognize that, um, that the pathways for entering the economy in Canada are much more difficult than they should be. Um, in the 1980s, an immigrant to Canada, remember in the 80s, an immigrant to Canada was somebody with, with, uh, without post-secondary education who tended to come from a rural background and, and didn't speak the language very well. Nevertheless, an immigrant to Canada in the 1980s tended to reach the same income level as average Canadians uh, within the first 10 years uh, of arriving. And, and seven out of 10 of them owned a house within the first five years. Um, now, even though a newcomer to Canada is overwhelmingly somebody with a university degree who speaks either English or French, uh, within 10 years of arriving, they have, uh, newcomers have a poverty rate, which is something like 30 or 40% higher than average Canadians and, and, and uh, lo other low income rates that are, the, 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 their, their average incomes are lower. It takes longer than 10 years now to get up to par uh, uh, with Canada. That's partly because of the thing I mentioned before, we're really terrible at recognizing foreign credentials. We have a hypocritical immigration system that only takes in people with advanced skills and trades and, and degrees, and yet we have an employment system in both the professions and the trades uh, that does not recognize those credentials uh, from somewhere else, if, and, and, or that, that requires uh, huge barriers to be overcome. We waste the first generation. The number of immigrants that give up because it's just gonna to be too hard to get your credentials recognized and to work in the profession that you studied uh, and they end up driving taxi for the rest of you know, the next 20 years just so that their kids can actually get a professional degree and so on. So we tend to waste, the, we, we waste the generation that arrives in Canada and because we profit on the Canadian born generation. And the, to make it worse, a lot, of, a lot of people arrive in Canada with a fancy, you know, with a nursing degree or something from some country where the, where the medical hospital, the medical uh, college where they studied nursing was funded by Canadian foreign aid in order to develop medical talent in that country. And 100% of the graduates of that, that Canadian funded place end up leaving their country and coming to Canada or somewhere like Canada to practice and then discover that they can't practice easily and they give up on it. So we waste a lot of resources on the first generation and we waste, we waste a lot of inventive people, right? We're, we're good at some things. We're good at, we, we allow people to stay in Canada for longer after they finish their advanced degrees so that they might want to stay in Canada and start a company or something like that. The Americans kick you out after, after a couple months. So we're good at some things, but we're not good at ensuring people enter the country. I'm living in Germany now, and Germany has a lot to learn from Canada in terms of, of how to um, allow immigrants to become citizens very quickly before they've learned the language and things like that. But we, what we have to learn from them is, is they, they, they invest and they spend big upfront to get newcomers into the economy. They have apprenticeship systems that allow people, uh, as soon as they're on the ground, to be on the job and learning while they're on the job and not waiting until they've learned, learned uh, uh, in a school or something before they can start getting employment. So, so, so we have a lot to learn from other countries in that regard. And of course, we have to deal with, with the housing problem. And a lot of people, when they talk about population growth, they say, well, my God, I mean, my kids, uh, are living in my basement and they're going to be living in my basement until they're 40. How can we talk about uh, having more people in Canada? And I partly think that that very answer points to a little bit of hope in being able to open up the crisis of housing supply. Um, I think of like initiatives 
that the city of Toronto recently allowed uh, those garage sheds that in this part of Toronto fill all the back laneways to theoretically possibly be turned into separate uh, apartment units, uh, which had been long fought for and it had been long resisted and, and much like the idea of turning uh, houses along streets into duplexes or triplexes or sixplexes, which still isn't a reality. Um, most of the resistance came from people who said, well, if you turn your garage shed into an apartment, the person moving into that is some weirdo from somewhere else who I don't know, and I don't want some weirdo from someone else living behind the house beside me, and that sort of thing. And there's been a somewhat of a generational change in that respect in Canada because of the housing crisis in that people are now more likely to look at somebody turning the garage shed into an apartment building and say, oh, that's my kids. Finally, that's, that's what they're looking for and they're going to be able to live there. So when you look at the person who is desperately seeking housing in a city instead of being some stranger from somewhere else, instead of being your own family or even yourself, uh, it, it causes a bit of a sea change in the ideology around that. There's still a long way to go uh, in that sort of thing. Um, I think, because I often live away from Toronto for long times and then come back, and things are a little more open now um, to development of property. It was interesting, to, it was weird coming in this week to see like uh, all of, half of Jarvis Street turning from weird old rooming houses into, uh, into what'll soon be big apartment towers and that, uh, and that sort of thing. I think, I think the shape of it will change, and I don't know the, the decisions behind that, and I hope a lot of them are rental units. Uh, but uh, it, is, it is changing, but slowly. Um, and, uh, but I think it helps, as with, as, as with family policy, that it, this is no longer a, a competition game between newcomers and established Canadians. Uh, established Canadians are just as likely to be pinched by the housing crisis in the next generation uh, as, as newcomers are. So uh, I, think, I, think, I think we do have hope and we do have to confront that. And I would argue that uh, the prospect of an increasing population does not make these decisions more difficult. In a way, it makes them easier because, because we have to confront them. We are, going to, we, we are going to have new people seeking new housing. We are going to have new people entering the, uh, a more difficult labor market. We have a labor market that um, is much less dependent on a lifetime job with the pension and that sort of thing, and much more dependent on um, portfolios of different forms of employment. Uh, some gig economy stuff, some contract work there. Even very low, even you know, newcomers to Canada now spread their income sources across a wide range of employment. You know, the, uh, you work a little bit in your friend's shop, you buy and sell some stuff, you do some Uber driving. Uh, your actual uh, annual income probably looks better than than your grandfather who worked in a factory, uh, but but your cash flow looks terrible because it's coming from all sorts of places and you don't have a stable pension uh, or that sort of thing. And we don't have the forms of support. This is the way people settle in, start in Canada now. It's not by getting a job in a factory, it's by doing this whole portfolio of different things. And we don't have the federal supports and provincial supports for that type of fragmented employment yet that's gonna become more common. But that's not just a problem for the next 60 million Canadians who arrive here at the airport, that's a problem for our children, for us in many cases, and so on. And again, having it be understood as part of the future population growth of Canada will help us uh, understand that, uh, help, us, help us get our heads around the, the policy thinking for that. So, so in summary, I would say we need to think of, of of Canada with three times as many people, not as being some abstract idea in the future, not something that we should fight about whether it should happen or not, but as a thing we should assume is going to happen regardless of what we think about it, even if it doesn't, whether you like it or not, the decisions we make in order to make to prepare for that eventuality are the decisions we should be making right now for ourselves, even if the population doesn't grow at all. So thank you very much. Okay, that was great. So what we're going to do now is a, is a bit of a moderated Q&A, so I hope uh, that a lot of you have questions. 
Um, I'll start off by asking one question um, that I've thought about since reading your book and, and kind of that, that was, uh, that I remembered while, while listening to you, is that you, there's this um, idea that you mentioned about the nonlinear scaling properties of cities. Mm -hmm. Cities, there, there's some ecological and economic efficiencies of just growing and growing and growing. Um, why, why is this thesis, uh, why is it not maximum Toronto? Why is it not a Toronto of 20 million people? And I, I think a lot of your book speaks to that and one kind of caveat is when you talk about these uh, kind of tier two cities as innovation centers. So I, I just wonder why, how do we square that? Why not just double, triple down on Toronto and, uh, and just take a, a much more urban concentration approach? Partly because that's gonna happen anyway. Um, I mean, look, uh, about half of the immigration to Canada takes place in the greater Toronto area. Um, and my relatives in Alberta are always surprised by that. They're like, okay, even during the oil boom years, they were like, they were like well, why isn't everyone coming to, uh, to where we are and that sort of thing. And that's partly because um, the way settlement works is you, people who immigrate to a country, they're looking for three things. Uh, first is known employment or um, small business opportunities and usually through direct communication with people who are established there, you're not, you're not gonna settle somewhere where you're not gonna make a living. Second thing is networks of people from the same background who speak the same language and who are gonna loan you money and give you a place to sleep during your first two years and, uh, uh, and, and sell the types of food you wanna eat and, and that sort of thing. And the third is uh, housing that you can afford. But of those three, and this is consistent through interviews with, with, with people seeking to be immigrants, the one that everyone will drop first is the third one, right? People settle where the housing is unaffordable. People will always settle where the housing is unaffordable. If the housing is super affordable and is a bargain, nobody wants to settle there. Because you have to ask, what makes that housing so cheap? It's because there's no economy, or because there's, you know, uh, I, was, I was talking to a mayor of a, of a town coat bus in, in Eastern Germany who, who was trying to attract refugees because they had tons of abandoned housing. Uh, of reasonably good quality. It's like, okay, you have no factories, you have no jobs, uh, you have racist gangs roaming the streets who will beat people up, and, uh, and, and if you open a little shop, there's no consumers who will spend any money. So we need to recognize that, that there are incentives to Canada's largest metropolitan areas uh, regardless uh, if the housing's unaffordable. Um, people, People will settle, and people will still buy housing. I mean, more than half of immigrants to Canada are still buying a house within, within five or six years, even though there's even the, like the ugliest uh, Freddy Krueger house in Toronto is over a million dollars now. And they're doing it because they're syndicating complex loans across multiple branches of their family just to finance the down payment and that sort of thing. So you need to create incentives for people to settle elsewhere. Um, I don't believe that you should try to legislate where people settle. I think, I mean, I'm not some sort of libertarian, but I, I, think, uh, I think water finds its own level and, and, and people, immigrants have more knowledge of economic realities and so on than governments can. They, they do tend to gravitate to the places that make more sense for them, but we see this gravitation toward the mid-sized cities and so on. Statistically, they're not gonna account for as much as the huge metropolitan areas, but they're gonna be very important and we should, they should, we should encourage them. And if you talk to the mayors of these smaller cities with universities in them, they are desperate to get people in. And, and even cities like Winnipeg, the mayor of Winnipeg was horrified last year Remember that debacle when everybody wanted to bid to become the second uh, Amazon headquarters and we, every city humiliated itself and prostrated before Amazon and excavated. Winnipeg was horrified because uh, uh, you could only enter a bid if you had a population of a million. And I think Winnipeg is like 923,000 now or something like that. And it became, it became a whole thing in the city of, okay, we've got to get up to a million, you know, and, and, and that sort of thing. So there's, I mean, outside of the, of the three or four or five big metropolitan areas, there's a whole world of Canada that is looking for growth. And a lot of northern places are looking for growth too. Iqaluit does not like the fact that it's our, it's our major northern city. It's, it's, it's the capital 
uh, of the, you know, the first indigenous self-governed territory in, in the Western world, uh, yet it has 7,000 people and no institution of higher learning or anything like that. Whereas, and it's actually below the Arctic Circle. Whereas like Finla Finland's equivalent, Rovaniemi, which is actually above the Arctic Circle, has two universities and, and 60,000 people and that sort of thing. So, uh, so there's, a lot of, there's a lot of scope for, there's a lot of places that have an appetite for population growth. And, and that should be encouraged as much as possible. But I also have to be a realist and say the big metropolitan areas are gonna ab absorb the lion's share of it. Sure, my second and last question before I open it up, uh, a political question. For, for all of these events, we do some, some degree of social media marketing. Um, for this event specifically, we, we did some Facebook ads to, to get people to show up and we were surprised by the amount of engagement we got on our Facebook ads. Um, engagement. <laughs> and, and also by the, the, uh, the overwhelmingly negative tone of that engagement. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned that um, this sort of political sentiment typically doesn't have that much of an effect on uh, immigration levels because the economy is a bigger driver uh, or not of, of immigration. Um, that said, for a sufficiently uh, motivated kind of anti-immigrant movement or, or party, what levers are available? Is this just not a concern at all or is it, it we're, we're not there yet? Oh, we could be there. Um, we, I mean, look, we have an angry nativist politics in, in, in Canada. I mean, it exists. I think we were a little bit assuaged in the federal election because there was an upstart party based on angry nativist uh, xenophobic sentiments whose even its leader failed to, to keep his seat and that sort of thing. And uh, the branch of the conservative party that's a bit like that uh, did, didn't seem to be the, the thing that was driving the party to victory and what could have been a winnable election for them otherwise. Uh, but that said, there is a constituency of Canadians that by some measures is maybe 15%, but that could become part of a larger group. Uh, and look, what, what looks at, look what's happened. Quebec has, has passed laws that are discriminatory. Um, the idea of somebody who is an ultra-conservative guy who says racist things and doesn't like immigration becoming a successful politician in Canada uh, is not that alien because we had a mayor who was just such a person. No, he did not run, uh, although Rob Ford gave speeches in 2011 saying Toronto, immigration should be banned from Toronto, right? That we should, uh, it, and uh, people ignored it because it was just crazy uh, Rob. But, uh, uh, so we had the most diverse city in Canada where 50% of the population are foreign born, who elected a guy who uses, whose every sentence contained racial slurs and, uh, uh, and uh, made speeches against immigration and so on, and who was largely elected by a constituency of people who were, who were new Canadians of, from you know, racial and religious minority backgrounds. So Canada, it's possible that sort of thing could happen, intolerance, I've, I've often said Canada's gift to the world of politics could be what I call rainbow intolerance, right? We could have constituencies of people from very different backgrounds who for various reasons don't like newcomers, maybe not in general, but who don't like those newcomers or this religion or this group and that sort of thing. And somebody who is shrewd could, could, could do that. So yeah, uh, that could happen in Canada. As I've said, I don't actually think it would affect national immigration rates all that much. First of all, because, because immigration rates tend to be linked to the economy much more than to the politics. And second of all, because it tends to fail, right? Uh, it's very hard to get, you might be able to restrict people from that group, like the US president has attempted to do, or that other group, uh, but uh, not in the long run. And, and, and I actually think a lot of the demographics work against that. Younger Canadians are less inclined to those types of beliefs in politics, not just because they're young and young people tend to be more liberal, but even more so than people my age were when we were young or people 20 years older than me were when, when they were young. So, so I, I would, I'd like to think that, but, but yeah, I don't think we're, we're particularly virtuous or, or, or mm -hmm. safe or anything like that. Yeah, I think that's, a, that's an optimistic um, lesson. Uh, any questions from the audience for Doug? Yes. Um, 
maybe two part question. One, at what level of government do you think this is most likely to happen? But two, what, what would be like a, a singular, call it feasible policy within a short number of years that you think would have the greatest impact towards like our preparedness for growth? And would that more likely happen at the municipal, provincial, or federal level? Yeah, that's, those are very interlinked questions yeah. because, look, Canadian federalism has a structural problem. Um, I mean, not just because we were kind of uh, crippled at birth by the by the creation of provinces, which are which are which are not a great way to distribute governing powers, um, but because a lot of the biggest issues uh, and most expensive and vexatious issues in Canada are ones that manifest themselves at the municipal or local or like local regional level, yet where the governments at the municipal or regional level have absolutely no jurisdiction or often funding ability over those things. I mean, immigration being the big one, right? It's strictly national policy in every country in the world. Only national governments uh, have anything to do with immigration, yet it manifests itself like 90% in, in urban municipalities. Um, and, and they have, you know, n nothing, nothing to do with it. It's, it's just something that happens. People arrive. Um, now, that said, uh, I've often, I often think sometimes national governments make better local governments than, than municipal governments do. I mean, the, the local branches of your, fed your federal government service office and your provincial government service office on, your, on the main street near you in your city are probably the, the forms of local government you engage with more than the actual municipal government. So Canada's funny that way in that, in that our higher levels of government are lower ones. But it, it creates problems, and I don't need to say, say this to anyone in Toronto, when those three levels of government have very different politics. Right? When you hypothetically have a municipal government that is at war with the provincial government because its leader was defeated by the, as in his mayoral campaign, uh, uh, which is itself at war with the federal government for various ideological reasons, it does not create a great environment for long-term planning of growth needs of a country. So I would say the one big thing is that Canadian governments spend a lot on infrastructure. Um, we do not lack for investment. It's, it's a big line item in, in the federal budget. Uh, it's a big item in many of the provincial budgets. Um, municipalities, in terms of infrastructure, tend just to be recipients of funds from higher levels of government, so that's a different thing. Uh, but uh, 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 there's no coordination around population growth, and we tend to waste infrastructure spending. We still do, right? I, I cannot think of a Canadian federal government that has done infrastructure spending in a way that really is guided around a proper plan for where the growth of the country is going to be. Uh, it, it, in, unless you look back to the 1950s and 60s. Uh, it tends to get wasted partly because it's, a, I mean, cynically, infrastructure spending is a way to get votes. Uh, if you look at where libraries get, get built, it, it, Canada has some beautiful new libraries. They do tend to be in places where people voted the right way or where they might in the next election. Um, and just because there's ill coordination between government levels. And we should be at a point where we have coordinated uh, planning for future growth between multiple levels of government and also multiple departments. There's some really good, uh, there's, there's some really good uh, uh, projection planning for population, particularly in the, the, gov in the municipal governments of the larger cities, uh, where there's really accurate work done on who's going to be settling where and where they're going to be coming from and where we, where we need to be settling people and so on. And several of the departments of the federal government do this kind of work as well, and some of the provincial government individual departments do. They very rarely coordinate any of these things. These things, they, there's, there's, there's very little really big mega planning between levels of government and departments around how to spend infrastructure money to best, ad best address growth. So it's, it's sort of like an unsexy answer to that, but it, it's, it's, it's that we actually have a lot of the fiscal resources there and they're being dumped into the economy to build things and with, without really any coordinated 
uh, way of looking at it. And particularly because we're entering a worldwide economic time when governments are going to be wanting to dump money into the economy in order to get economic growth going again. We're going to be in a period like we were in like 29, 2010, uh, where the words helicopter money are going to be popular. Let's, let's throw a bunch of money into the economy to, to restart uh, uh, consumption. And uh, uh, it's a it would be a wasted opportunity if we weren't using that as a chance to build the climate resilience infrastructure we need, to be building the green transportation infrastructure we need, to be building the green building and energy infrastructure we need, and building the transportation infrastructure we need for the growth that's going to occur in the next 50 years. Um, as I was reading your book, I'll ask one more question. Uh, you spent a lot of time talking about housing. Um, but as I, as I read other sections, there was one uh, framing in which all of this is about housing, right? If you care about fertility rates, some amount of the, of the problem of not being able to afford extra kids is that we live in a city in particular where uh, you, you need two uh, incomes to, to pay the rent. Um, some amount of anti-immigrant sentiment has to do with this idea of, of a scarce housing supply and it's a fixed pie uh, and, and political, for political reasons we can't grow it, therefore you know, we want to retain mo more of it for ourselves. On the ecological grounds, you mentioned kind of the efficiency of, of living in cities. Um, how much of this gets solved if we just uh, uh, upzone and allow for more housing? Probably, I mean, ultimately, all of it, potentially, yeah. right? I mean, I mean, I mean, as as I, as I said, most cities in Canada could triple their population without expanding their envelope or changing the neighborhood quality of life at all, just by. Uh, just just by allowing a lot of single family houses to become six plexes or something like that, uh, and allowing the, you know major intersections to have a few more apartment towers and that sort of thing, and destigmatizing living in apartments. We're the, we're one of the weirdest countries in that um, we're the only country in the Western world that I know of that has a separate word for an apartment. Uh, depending on the form of ownership tenure of it. We somehow refer to apartments that people own as condos, as if there's some sort of different, you know, structure or thing than an apartment, even though most condos are rented, right? Like whoever owns them rents them to someone. Most of the rental housing stock in Toronto is condominium owned and it's, it's rented out to uh, somebody and that sort of thing. The word con, and, and we're the old, definitely the only country where that word has a social stigma, right? It's a dirty word and, um, I, I wonder when Manhattan passed that line where the idea of an apartment stopped being a, st a stigma uh, and so on, probably about 1905 or something like that. And, uh, uh, or Hong Kong, I think it was, it, was, uh, it was the dawn of time or something like that. Um, and it's, it's a way of living that's ecologically efficient. It, it's great for community cohesion. Uh, it's good for children uh, and, uh, and, and so on. But we, we, still, st we still stigmatize it. And that's creating sort of a nasty class divide in most of the cities of Canada. Um, although a weird one, right? You're, mm -hmm. you're, if you live in an, in an apartment or a condo as we call it, you are both a super elite uh, outsider who's not to be trusted, and you are some poor, deprived person who doesn't have an actual house uh, at the same time. So, so we we need to get we need to get around that a little bit around around the idea that 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 uh, that you need to have a yard on the front and side of your house that you never use in order to be a real citizen. Right. Yes.
Yeah, you're entirely right, and I'm focusing on a small part of it. And, uh, but simply allowing things to happen and, and waiting for the market to take care of it ta will take too long. Um, and we know that because there's a whole bunch of initiatives out there to try to, Toronto has a bunch of new ones to allow forms of intensification in neighborhoods. Yes, we, we still don't allow single family neighborhoods to become multiplex neighborhoods, but we do have laneway things. We do have, we do have uh, the tower renewal program that allows the empty spaces between slab apartments to be developed with, sadly not with housing, but with, with, with other forms of development. And those are slow because they, you really have to wait 20, 30 years for somebody to decide, oh, I can make a bit more money off this patch of land uh, and so on. So you're quite right there. Do need to do it. And there's a lot of opportunities in having a municipal strategy to do things. We're very slow catching up. And you see that um, the, best, the best physical example in Toronto I know of is people, people pointed out to me, maybe even you pointed out to me, that uh, when you're flying into Toronto from somewhere else, from, from Lake Ontario up to Pearson, and you fly over, you can see the Young Line. You can see it perfectly, because every stop on the Young Line has apartment towers clustered around it, so you can see the map of it. You can't see the Bloor line, or sorry, the number two line uh, at all, because the Bloor line was built and developed during the period of housing surplus in, in, in Toronto when the public sentiment was that property development was, was the ruination of nice neighborhoods rather than the creation of housing, because, because we, and that psychology defined it. And that still, is, that still is a problem because we don't have a strategy, or only now are starting to have the beginnings of one just to develop the areas around the major subways. I mean, there should be no subway station that doesn't have a hell of a lot of apartment towers around it. There's no excuse to be living within a few blocks of a subway station uh, unless you can put a lot of people around there because it, 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 you know, share the wealth and that sort of thing. But I even think of like, um, every time I come back to Toronto, uh, I go to Dundas West Station because I get off the Up Express uh, there. Dundas West and Bloor should be it should be like uh, it should be like you know it should be like young young and Eglinton, right? It's I mean it it there's no beautiful neighborhood there to be ruined or anything like that. You have a bunch of really ugly 1970s government buildings and that sort of thing, and an, a condo tower that started to be built with a giraffe painted on the side of it that was that was killed by NIMBYism, and that sort of thing. And I don't know when that's going to turn into the. I mean, there could be 20,000 more people living right at that corner. Uh, without any effort. So yes, big projects. You don't have to have a computer company from, um, from Silicon Valley necessarily driving them. And I think that particular instance uh, poisoned people away from really big development, development projects. Uh, and it's tended to dis distort the landscape. But yes, there needs to be big strategies and big, big projects. They need to be multi-form. They need to be multiple forms of tenure. They need to be multiple scales of housing. And, I, and most importantly, and I, wish, I think we, we need to keep learning this lesson, there needs to be pathways between the different tenures of housing. You need to have social housing that you can purchase. You need to have rental housing that can move into ownership housing within the same building and that sort of thing, so you have communities. Anyway, we know how to do that. Toronto has examples of, of how to do that type of housing, but we have not had that type of strategy in years. The last time there was a real serious federal-funded housing strategy was the 1970s, and, uh, and um, so yes, there needs to be a push. Maybe there's the political will now that we've all realized our kids can't uh, afford the rent and they're gonna be in our basement till they're 40, you know. Well, good news at Dundas and Bloor, the southeast corner, which is arguably the, the ugliest corner, there is a 4,000 unit uh, proposal uh, put forth by Choice Reed, which is the real estate arm of Loblaws. So that should transform and the giraffe site also has an open proposal. So hopefully it looks a little different in five years than it does today. Uh, yes, right in the middle there. Uh, so a lot of your book relies on the ability to make projections of the future. And so you get sources from the federal government, provincial government, et cetera. If you went back 30 years ago, did they get any of their projections for today wrong? And if so, how do we know that your projections that you're presenting are going to be reliable in the future? 30 years ago would have been... Uh... Oh, like 50 years ago. Like Diefenbaker in the 50s said Canada would have 40 million people in the year 2000. That didn't happen, right? So. 
And uh, Laurier said we'd have 100 million by uh, the end of the 20th century. Yeah. So uh, I'm not relying on projections as being hard and fast things. I'm using them as examples for, for exercises in thinking. I mean, um, we, we will have some sort of fiscal problem in the 2030s and 2040s by the baby boom generation. Uh, uh, entering a more dependent uh, age. Um, whether it's going to be precisely the slices on the pie that the best informed projections say, who knows? Uh, and there's, a, there's enough variables in those equations to say so, to, 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 to change it in, in various directions. Yeah. But uh, that's, a, that's a fixed thing. That's not, that's not, that's not, a, that's not a variable thing. No amount of uh, immigration is going to completely eliminate that that thing. The fact that there is a the, the age pyramid of Canada is a projection that's ne that's never wrong because that's just a reality. It sometimes extends a bit longer. I don't think we would have anticipated 50 years ago that our longevity would be as as long, our healthy longevity would be as long as it is now, and that creates problems because it means that the Canadians live extremely long now, longer than we ever thought we would. But our health is not necessarily great, and so our, our extreme health care costs continue. We have a lot of people who live to be 100, but their brains live to be 80. Uh, and, uh, and the cost of that is something we don't really understand properly yet. The fact that a very large proportion of our labor demands in the 2030s and 2040s are going to be basically elder care, which is not something that our immigration system is completely designed around, except in a, a very cruel uh, 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 short-term visa thing that we have for, for, uh, for care workers and that sort of thing. Um, we're going to have crises around, around, around that sort of thing. We have, we have an immigration system geared toward high-skilled people coming to Canada. We're going to have some demographic realities that are going to need a lot of, a lot of very dedicated people who are, who, who are in a low-skill area. Uh, uh, Unless there's technological innovation. You could like have our care robot spoon feeding us, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you need someone to service that though. And, uh, and, I, and I, I don't see any realistic projections that, that the new technology will, will cause a jobless future. I mean, um, um, we, know it'll, we know it'll kill a third of existing jobs, we don't know what third, uh, but but we also don't know what extra third, third or forty percent or fifty percent or sixty percent it's, it's, it, it, the technology will create, uh, and so on. So there are a lot of things that can't be projected. Um, and as I said, it's more important to have a mindset uh, built on future growth because you either have to be playing catch up with past growth, or you need to be planning for future growth. Over planning for future growth is a mistake that can be made. Um, you can build, you can build a giant airport when there's not going to be a big demand for flying. You can build a giant pipeline when uh, ten years before everybody switches to electric vehicles and that sort of thing. So over planning or mis planning, but it's better than under planning. We're going to do three questions in sequence, and then he'll answer all three, and that'll that'll be it. So uh, yes. Um, first of all, uh, Mark McKeon says hi. <laughs> the question I have is, how can Canada attract the number of people uh, that you're talking about there, given other countries also want or having those same demographic problems and challenges? That's the first question. Second question. Uh, I want to address the, we see the first generation. Do you think that uh, our lack of being able to reskill them or, or adopt their, their, their skills now is based <coughs> more xenophobia or more of a gap of skills? Question, then. Yep. I was going to ask that question, but I have a backup. So. <laughs> do, you think, um, do you think the rapid uh, electrification of, of the vehicle fleet is going to tip the balance for the demand for uh, electrical energy, which might make it possible to do a, a, a big shift? You're saying it's, there's not enough population density now at, at West, for example, to uh, support the investments in infrastructure needed to do that, but will the will that equation change? On that one, I don't know. Um, I'd like like it if that happened. Um, I don't know how long it'll take 
for the transition to non-fossil fuel transportation uh, to work. I would be surprised if by the end of the next decade the majority of transportation isn't electric. Um, but, you know, things have surprised me before. Um, and, uh, uh, and I don't know, I don't know what that'll mean. I don't know how much of agriculture can, can change that way. Um, I don't know how long it'll take to change. I think, I think, I think, I think, like you said, with housing, waiting, waiting for, waiting for the market to take care of it may be too long, particularly given our economic um, And uh, I think we need to get ahead of it and push it. Uh, and it's a lot easier to do pushes if you have if you have huge concentrations of population to make it a little bit more fiscally robust. Now, these two questions are kind of linked. Um, if um, we're at an interesting point, if you look at the long-term span of, of the century, uh, where probably unless World War III happens. Um, by the end of this century, the population of the world will no longer be growing, it will be, it'll be shrinking. Uh, which, in sort of a larger thermodynamic sense, is probably a welcome thing. You cannot have infinite unlimited growth in people who consume resources even by just breathing. Um, uh, but it will be a little trickier for Canada's conventional policies to work uh, at that point. Not because there will be a shortage of people who want to come to Canada, um, but because it'll be, uh, immigration will be much more of, of, uh, of a seller's market. Um, this will be a moment that I, I like to call peak people, right? When we, right now we have a, in terms of, the number of people willing to move internationally is never that large, right? It, at most it's, it's sort of 3% of the world's population. In other words, 97% of the people in the world spend their entire lives in the same jurisdiction they're assigned at birth, right, in the same country. 3% who move internationally uh, are never as large a group as we think. Uh, right now, there is, in the minds of some countries, a surplus of such people, though, so most countries have policies designed to restrict how many people can come in. Uh, that's standard thinking, and it has been for decades. But um, most of the so-called sending countries no longer have fast-growing populations, and many of them have I mean, China will soon have a shrinking population. Uh, Iran now has 1.2 children per family, so it will have a shrinking population within a generation. Turkey as well. Bangladesh has 2 point something children per family, and so on. So a lot of the countries that we think of as, as, as being big senders of people are going to have their own problems with shrinking labor forces and, and so on. It doesn't mean a lot of middle class people still won't want to come to Canada, but it means that Countries like Canada and France and, uh, and Germany and maybe even the United States, instead of competing to have restrictionist policies, will be competing to offer, we have the most generous family reunification pr program. You can bring in not just, your, not just your kids and your mom and dad, but also your, your first cousins and that sort of thing. I mean, I, I, I foresee a situation uh, like that where it will be, it'll become more difficult. I don't want to exaggerate that uh, too much, but there's an opportunity if, we, if if you do think that Canada needs to snap up to a larger level of population density and and, and, and so on. Uh, and so on. I mean, I should stress I don't think having an absolute population matters at all. I don't think I don't think having a hundred million population. I'm not. There are other people who say, oh, we need this number in order to so that we can still be in the G7, we want to be in the seven largest populations, or, or in order to have military strategic might, or that sort of thing, we need to have, I do not believe a large population matters by itself at all, in any, in any way. I mean, among the most successful countries in the world, uh, economically, are countries like Israel and Switzerland and Norway, which have tiny populations, but they have tiny geographies as well. So it's, it's entirely a matter of, of, of uh, density and concentration and capacity, mostly capacity. Do we have the size of consumer market to uh, to be able to 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 do things successfully? Do we have enough of an audience to have you know a national television station? Uh, we don't uh, without 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 heavy duty subsidy. Do we have um, 
do we have enough of a fiscal base to provide tax revenues to pay for the things we would like to have? Can we, do we have enough of population in the right places to have the institutions that are great that don't require, I mean, a tenth of the Canadian population lives outside of Canada. Uh, most of them because uh, they have to, because you just can't do the things in a country with such a low density of population at the highest levels that you can't say so you have to live somewhere else. No, very few other Western countries have a tenth of the population that we have. That's a larger number of Canadians than the populations of, of most of our provinces, right? Uh, so, um, so, so we, we do need to deal with, with that problem of having the size of institutions and culture and political base uh, uh, and so on. And I, anyway, a long roundabout way of saying that, that it's much easier for us to snap up to that point where we need to be to have what I would call a sustainable population uh, now during a period where it's easy to attract people than it will be in the later, probably in the later half of this century when it will be harder to attract people. And as for the first generation problem, this is, I mean, this is, this is a long-term thing in Canada. It's long been our model that, that uh, you come to Canada, you throw away whatever you have. Can you, people who come to Canada are middle class where they come from, and they're in poverty when they're in Canada, often for quite a few years. Um, and is that, you ask, is that, is that because of xenophobia? Uh, or is that just a structural thing in the way we do things? It's hard to separate the two. I would say it's both because I don't think I don't think that the uh, trades guilds or professional institutions and so on would be so restrictive in allowing people in um, if it was white and blue people entirely doing it. I think the idea of an entire cohort and generation of people forced to be taxi drivers um, in order to get their children through education, I think we, I think, look, I think a lot of established, you know, white Canadians are able to brush that off and say, well, that's just what you do. If, you're, if you've arrived here from India or China or something like that, you do the taxi driver thing, it's neat, we like our taxi drivers and uh, that sort of thing. And um, there was a there was a terrible Canadian romantic comedy at the beginning of this decade. What was it called? It's called uh, Doctor Cavi, I think. It's about a it was about a, a guy who comes from India. His family gets a fancy medical degree in India. His family like finance uh, uh, him to come to Canada to become a doctor. He's really successful. And he ends up driving actually a co-op cab in Toronto. It's filmed. It's filmed in or maybe back cab, I can't remember. And, and there's a scene where he's kind of despairing, he's driving his taxi, so on bumps in the cab and all that sort of thing. And he stops in some park where a bunch of cabs are parked and they're all you know, having a coffee or a beer or something like that. And they all complain about their job. And he said, oh, I got it so much worse. You know, I'm actually a doctor, I got a medical degree. And everyone around him says, what are you talking about? I'm a physicist with a degree in physics from Addis Ababa. And it's like, it's, it's, it, it's like I'm, oh yeah, well, I'm, 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 a, I, I'm a civil engineer from, from Guangdong and that sort of thing. And it was a fairly realistic scene. And, uh, <laughs> and, and I, I, I do think that we've become used to the idea that that's just the way things are. That's, that's, we, we just throw away a generation like that and, and it's okay because that's the Indian Canadian or Chinese Canadian or, or African Canadian way of doing things. So I'm used to, when I get into a cab in Toronto, I always ask the driver uh, about his education. And I don't, I don't think in the last like, two years I've had a taxi driver with less education than me. So uh, uh, that's not a good sign. It's not, it's, it, it's not prestigious. It may be, we're used to the Canadian model, and I was explaining this in Europe. The Canadian model is that we don't support newcomers very much at first because we have relied on private market housing as an <coughs> instrument of integration for the last century. The standard way newcomers to Canada have fit themselves into the economy and the education system is by purchasing housing uh, and, and investing in it and, and profiting from its growth. That is much harder to do now. 
I'm now doing work in countries where, like Germany and Switzerland where 90% of people are renters, like middle class people all rent. And, it's, and suddenly you have to think of economic inclusion, not just for newcomers, but for people trying to have social mobility within the country at, as happening through some instrument other than ownership of private market housing. English speaking countries do integration through private market housing, market housing purchase. Canada, the United States, Britain, that's how integration happens. The only non English country I can think of is, is Belgium, where, where it is by housing, uh, to a large degree. And we're no longer in an economy where that model necessarily works. And we have to think about new ways of investing in newcomers. And, and, uh, and I think for partly, like, for partly reasons of stereotypes, we have an image of how you settle in Canada that's, that's based on how generations did it in the 50s and 60s and 70s that no longer makes uh, uh, sense now. So yes, no matter what way of saying, yeah, it's both. Got it. Great. Well, just a reminder before we end that we do have books available for sale. Once again, if you want to purchase one, go to the same event right page that you bought the ticket for this event. There will be a line item for a book. If we sell out, which I don't think we will, you can point your phone camera at that QR code. And uh, Jeff Bezos will hand deliver a copy <laughs> to the um, So with that said, please join me in thanking Doug for this uh, awesome talk.